May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. On Easter, we are presented with a story. Now, modern intellectuals would add a couple of syllables and call it a narrative. But it's a story. And really, it's simply the story that St. Peter told. This story is what propelled Christianity around the globe. Basically, it boils down to this. They hung him on a cross and killed him. But God raised him back to life and showed him to us. And then we ate and drank with him. Mary went to the tomb expecting to find the body of Jesus. Instead, she and the other disciples found an empty tomb. And later they saw him alive. Now, when we hear a story like that, there are a few ways we could take it. I can think of a few. There are probably more. We could see it as a a ripping good yarn, right? Yeah, I raised from the dead. Woo! All right. Or we could see it as a nice fairy tale with a good moral to it. Ah, good will triumph in the end. Yay! All right. Those are a couple of positive ways we could look at it. We could also see it in a negative way, right? We could see it as a bad story that will lead people in the wrong direction and do harm. Okay? So we could also see it as sort of a wrong-headed but ultimately harmless story. Oh, people want to believe that. That's fine. Or we could also see it as history. Simply an account of what happened. So there are lots of ways you could, you could take this and respond to it. But I, I want to point out to you, if you haven't already noticed, that all of those different ways of responding to this narrative, this story, boil down logically to two. There are really only two logical choices here. Either this story is true, meaning it actually happened that way, or it is not. It either happened that way or it didn't. St. Peter clearly isn't telling this story as if it is fiction. He is telling this story as a history of the facts of the case. And we have to choose whether we're going to believe him or not. Now, if his story isn't true, Peter made this up, or if he is somehow duped and he's mistaken about this, then this whole thing is silly, right? We, we shouldn't even be here. If this, this story that St. Peter tells is not true, then we should all get more sleep on Sunday morning and I should go out and get a a job where I can actually do some good. Right? Because if this story isn't true, if it didn't actually happen like that, I'm really just peddling sentimental filth. And, And worse than that, you're actually buying the sentimental filth. If this story isn't a faithful account of the facts, then we have absolutely no excuse for wasting our time and our energy and our money on these foolish lies. 
In fact, if this is all lies, not only is it foolish, it is evil for us to even be here today supporting the lie. On the other hand, what if it's true? If this story is true, if all of this actually happened this way, then that fact is the single most important fact in the entire world. If we believe this story is true, then we will have to change the way we evaluate the entire story of Jesus and the God whom he claimed was his father. If we believe in the empty tomb, then we come to some very strange conclusions. We have to start, if we believe in that, then we have to start there and reason backwards from that empty tomb and accept what Jesus says about himself. And we have to accept that this patron god of this tiny ethnic minority in the Middle East has a claim on us that he actually created everything that is including us and that he demands our allegiance and that of course then I mean you can see the cascade effect here right that has some dire ethical consequences for us especially since you know, up until we accepted that fact, we thought we belonged to ourselves. But if this is true, then eventually it becomes very hard to avoid all of the basic, fundamental teachings of the Church of Christ as they have come down to us. If you just start with accepting the fact of the empty tomb, you simply can't get around this. You have to choose whether you believe it or not, and not choosing is a choice. The most important question of your life is this one Do you believe? Not are you okay with it, but do you believe that Simon of Galilee, the fisherman, and his friends told us the true story of what happened with Jesus? Do you believe that they found an empty tomb where there was a dead body a day and a half before? Now, we have very good evidence that this is a trustworthy account. A Christian believer does not, prior, uh, uh, opposed to uh, and contrary to popular opinion, a Christian believer does not swallow his religion whole on faith. If what you mean by faith is not having any evidence, right? What faith is, faith is simply trust in what God is doing based on the evidence of what God has done. And the evidence here is actually excellent. What could it possibly have been but what the apostles tell it was, tell us it was? It cannot possibly have been a hoax by the disciples. All of these men 
went to gruesome deaths insisting on the truth, the literal truth, of this one fact. It's why they died. So we know that that they weren't intentionally lying. We know that. Someone would have broken along the way somewhere, right? Under torture. We know they weren't intentionally lying. It can't be that they never meant it to be taken literally. St. Peter is very clear later on in his first letter to the churches that this story is not a kind of myth or a story that, that teaches a moral. Right? He actually uses that word, myth. He says, it wasn't, it's not a myth. Guys, we told you what happened. So we know they meant to be taken literally. It can't have been a mass delusion in which they all just agreed that they felt the truth of the resurrection. I, I actually like this argument. Um, it, it, it's the one that, on the face of it, it, it seems the silliest to me. But be that as it may. It can't have been that. Because if that was what it was, then I don't think they ever would have taken in someone like Saul of Tarsus, the pharisaical cynic who hated them. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have been convinced. So we know they weren't simply deluded. It can't be, this is another thing people bring up, it can't be that we have a, a corrupted text. Right? Some people will say, well, that's not what the Bible really said when it was written. It's just, you know, it's, it's like a telephone game. They copied the copies of the copies of the copies, and we don't know what it said. Well, sorry, but there are lots and lots of very early manuscripts, very early documents that point to the single truth of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So we know that it's not just a telephone game where the true story got fundamentally corrupted along the way. So far, so far, none of the arguments against this account of history hold up. The evidence, let's be clear, the evidence is all on the side of believers, not unbelievers. And if the story is true, if Jesus actually rose from the dead, and there is absolutely no evidence to the contrary, only conjecture and assumptions that disallow it, if Jesus actually rose from the dead, then that fact should penetrate absolutely every aspect of our lives. It should change everything. It will change the entire shape of our lives because everything that we do, once we accept this, will be done, or should be done, in Christ and with Christ and for Christ. Now I know, in one sense I'm preaching to the choir, right? You're all here. I don't get to talk to the people who don't come, so, you know. But, but why are we afraid? Why are we afraid to share this story? All the evidence is on our side. Anyone who just, just dismisses this story out of hand is being intellectually disingenuous. They're not being honest. Now, it may be hard to accept emotionally. We all get that. But if we accept this story, of the empty tomb, then 
it's our job to share the truth with other people, right? And once you have chosen to believe the story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there will be no going back. You will be his. And he will continue to shape and change you until you go to be with him. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.